Hello everyone, it's Wednesday, February the 25th, 2015. Well, this article could taken from The Independent. It's a little dark, it's a little sickening, and it's a whole lot of evil. The title of the article is How Psychopaths Hide in Plain Sight, A Psychological Analysis of Serial Killer Dennis Rader. And I will scroll down and look at that face. Wow. Is he not scary? He is scary. Psychopaths operate in a totally different moral universe. In the case of Dennis Rader, also known as BTK, he had almost perfected his disguise, even helping the police officer, who was assigned to catch him after he had been employed as a local compliance officer. As I entered the lift of my hotel in Wichita, Kansas, two other people joined me. Both were dressed as animals. Which floor asked the largest, who was dressed as, I think, a biker mouse? Eight, please, I replied, and we s then stood in total silence waiting for the doors to close. The biker mouse's companion seemed to be a stoat, although it was hard to tell given that most of his fur was acid green. All I knew was that no trace of human being pierced either of their costumes. Later, I discovered that there was a furry convention booked into my hotel. And so my days in Wichita would start and end with about a hundred people dressed as animals, or more exotically, as pseudo-animals, milling around, drinking coffee in the morning or beer at night. Even at the time, this seemed like a weirdly perfect motif for the blurred line between normality and oddness that had brought me to Kansas, and one which resonated with the man I had come to study. Wichita was the home and killing location of Dennis Rader, a serial killer who dubbed himself BTK, blind, torture, and kill, and who, for a number of reasons, is one of the stars of that deadly genre. My interest in Rader goes back a long way, partly because he is almost the complete embodiment of both the serial killer and the psychopath, a church-going, scout-leading family man. He also had a lifelong interest in bondage and sadism, he would call his penis Sparky in his writings that were later discovered after his arrest, which he indiscriminately inflicted on the ten people he murdered between 1974 and 1991, although he wasn't actually arrested until 2005. Like my furry friends in the lift, Raider too was disguised, only in his case it was as a human. It was a disguise that he had almost perfected, even helping the police after he had been employed as a local compliance officer. Little about Raider fits the typical pattern of a serial killer. Most serial killers, for example, start small. They will have had a history of violent fantasies, which will only very slowly get turned into reality. So they usually begin by assaulting people and then bit by bit as their fantasies take over and become more demanding, they start to kill. Not Raider. His first victims were an entire family, the Arteros, whom he killed in January 1974. Even during the first murder of Joseph Otero, 38, his wife Julie, 34, and their two children, Josephine, age 11, and her seven-year-old brother, Joey, he was in almost total control of the crime scene. Normally, we expect the serial killer's first kill to be somewhat botched and therefore a source of potential evidence. No such luck with the Oteros where Raider showed ingenuity and complete control. For example, he secured Joseph and Julie's compliance, and they allowed him to tie them up, promising them that he just wanted their car and some money, and then he would be on his way. Perhaps Joseph and Julie thought that if they didn't resist, Raider might leave more quickly, or at least not harm their two youngest children. Geographically stable, as opposed to transient, serial killers are usually caught quite quickly, 
but despite the fact that Raider killed entirely within Wichita and its en environs, he escaped justice for over 30 years. He also took long breaks between his murders, so that, for example, there was almost eight years between his murder of Nancy Fox in December 1977, which he described as his perfect hit, and Maureen Hedge, his next victim, in April 1985. This, too, is unusual for serial killers. They don't usually switch on and then off again their desire to kill. Killing is a compulsion for them, propelling them ever onwards to more victims and often in increasingly bizarre circumstances. This might make it appear that they want to be caught. Nothing can be further from the truth, although by the time that justice finally catches up with them, they have become so divorced from reality that they often simply don't realize how strange their behavior has become. They therefore take risks and impulsively know their plans, their modus operandi, and their criminological signature out of the window because they believe that this is no longer going to deliver a kill. Raider, like some serial killers, regularly communicated with the police and also with local, a local newspaper called the Wichita Eagle. But atypically, it was he himself who coined the name BTK. Communication in this way allows the killer to feel powerful, to be in charge, to be dominant. But then the communication stopped, reflecting a degree of self-control rather than the impulsive fantasies of his kills. Wichita secretly hoped that the BTK had gone away, that he had died or had been incarcerated for other crimes. It was only in 2004 that Raider started to get back in touch with the police some 13 years after his final murder of Dolores Davis, 62, in January of 1991. He was prompted to do so only because he was worried that in his 30th anniversary killing year, others were being given credit for the BTK murders, and so Raider was less than pleased. It was a mistake because the police were soon able to identify the location of the computer that he was using to write to them from the one in the Lutheran Church where Raider was president. Filming in Wichita, driving to all the key locations and deposition sites and talking with the police, court staff, and the journalists who worked the case, and with Raider's former neighbor, I could see that he was almost the perfect psychopath. Think of psychopathy as a personality disorder defined by a cluster of traits centered around three different factors which over time have become ingrained as beliefs and behavior. First, in their interpersonal style, which allows the psychopath to be glib, grandiose, dishonest, and manipul manipulative. They are always arrogant and deceitful in their day-to-day -day dealings. Second, as far as their behavior is concerned, psychopaths will be sensation-seeking, impulsive, reckless to the point of stupidity, seemingly having no thought for their own safety. Finally, psychopaths will have defective emotional responses so that they lack remorse for their manipulative, reckless behaviors and find it impossible to truly understand why is it that you might actually find their behavior wrong. In short, they just don't get it. They operate in a totally different moral universe. Raider could often be reckless in how he went about his murders, despite planning them with care, manipulative of his immediate family and of his community, arrogant in his demand for attention, and grandiose in his belief that he would not be caught and that he had somehow befriended the police officer assigned to catch him. He gave a jaw-droppingly insensitive performance in front of the judge and the families of his victims. He was, at last, publicly living the life less ordinary than he had always craved, and he could only previously achieve in private when he killed. Yet, according to his son, Raider was also the perfect father. And Paula Raider described her husband to the police as a good man, a great father. He would never hurt anyone. Indeed, that was the face that Raider liked to present to the community, to the scouts in his troop, and to the congregation of the church that he attended. Psychopaths, like Raider, often hide in plain sight. And, as I have often explained, if they had horns on their heads and long pointed tails, psychopaths would be much easier to identify and therefore avoid. However, some disguises are just too difficult to spot, 
until it's too late. Professor David Wilson is a criminolog criminologist who will be presenting Killer Psychopaths, which airs February 24th at 9 p.m. on Channel 5. Wow. Well, I don't normally post videos of quite this nature, but as I look at this guy, and he does really creep me out, I try to imagine people in my own life that I come in contact with every day. And the one thing that I pay attention to when I look at people is their eyes. And as I look at this man's eyes, his eyes are dead inside. There's something missing from his eyes. So when you're out and about with people, and you're coming in contact with people, pay attention to their eyes. They tell a story. Have a great day, everyone.